Well, uh, thanks very much everybody for coming. Um, and after such a, a wonderfully put together uh, presentation, I'm going to use very old technology. I'm going to read from my pen and paper. I'm going to talk to you about the history of the Ragged Schools, the inspiration for the Ragged University project, and I'm going to just illustrate some of the, the things that came of it and how it's influenced the whole world. Um, and peer-led teaching, the Madras teaching method, that just gets me going. So uh, thanks for letting me chew your ears off. Um, well, what are the Ragged Schools? Uh, it's a name given to disparate free education projects in the UK, which provided free education in, and in many cases, food, clothing and lodging for the poor uh, so that they could better their own circumstances. Traditions for free education long predate the Victorian ragged schools movement. A notable example being Humphrey Chetham. Chetham's College, Manchester, a uh, brilliant man, made his money in textiles, went, oh, I could do something useful with this money. So he took 22 young boys off the streets, fed them, clothed them, educated them. Uh, this, this made a huge difference and eventually it expanded to taking in 40. And th the tradition still exists today. I think the Chetons boys, as they get called, still turn out and the symbol they have and the symbol they wear is a pencil. So uh, I, I love that. I, I found that out by visiting the cathedral and talking with the, the historian at the cathedral. Um, the name the Ragged Schools came about because the clothes of people who attended them were rags. Not too dissimilar, I worked very hard. Um, in 1840, the, the London City Mission established five schools formed exclusively for children raggedly clothed. So that's a quote. Um, John Pounds is the man cited by Thomas Guthrie as the originator of the idea of the ragged schools. He would search the streets of Portsmouth for poor and homeless children, taking them into his workshop and teaching them basic reading, writing and arithmetic skills. He lived from 1766 to 1839 and began teaching poor children without charging fees in 1880. Hello. Uh, so, just to set the scene in which all of this is, is, is happening, uh, the Industrial Revolution has hit, the division of labour has been established as being very useful, um, Adam Smith has helped systematise economic thought in his Wealth of Nations after his theory of moral sentiments, uh, that's often forgotten. Um, Enlightenment philosophy, Enlightenment philosophy had worked its way into the water table and collectively people had joined forces to distribute knowledge in an industrial way. Uh, so the, the Enlightenment thoughts maybe of Sir Francis Bacon saying that we can all observe first principles, we can look, we can measure, we can think. They, uh, maybe they, they could be said to have been a major factor eventually into, into this period. So, in 1844, four people connected to the existing free schools met to form an organisation to unite the ragged schools. On April 11th, at 17 Ampton Street off Gray's Inn Road, the Ragged Schools Union was formed. Wealthy individuals such as Angelina Burdett Coots, Lady Georgina uh, Angelina Coots, and An Anthony Ashley Cooper, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, contributed money to the cause and got involved in the organisation for further free education. On the rooftops of London, the Earl of Shaftesbury gave the first sixpence to Dr. Bernardo to start, to start his own ragged school. Is uh, the same Dr. Bernardo's charity we know and love today. Um, 
The Ragged Schools Union began with about 200 teachers in 1844 and grew to about 1,600 by 1851. In the first 39 years, it is estimated that 300,000 destitute children received a free education. The Ragged Schools movement culminated in the 1870 Forster Education Act. So, let, let's think about this scene. Um, communities all over the place started to see what other communities communities had been doing. Uh, in Portsmouth there's this guy wandering around going, oh, come on in, this is how you read, this is how you write. Uh, all the way up to, to the north, Sheriff Watson in Aberdeen started his industrial feeding school, taking people off of the streets. Thomas Guthrie in Edinburgh, he, he started to, to get his sleeves rolled up in the Greyfriars Kirkyard, looked out over the old town. And people started to understand the, the importance and power of people having knowledge, people sharing their knowledge and skills. It fit, factors into all areas of life, our social lives, our economic lives, um, our, our personal satisfaction. Now what gets me most excited about this? <laughs> It's the peer-led education methods uh, that, that were really very much the vehicles that took this throughout the UK, but not. It didn't stop there. It went all around the world. Um, I'm very enchanted by the Madras peer-led teaching system developed by Dr. Andrew Bell. Um, so some of the names that, uh, that were attributed to this method of teaching were mutual instruction, monitorial instruction, or the Bell Lancaster method. Why were they developed? Well, huge class sizes, zero budget. Familiar? <laughs> uh, Andrew Bell and Joseph Lancaster in develop, uh, independently developed a peer-led education method, which was to influence education on a global scale during the 19th century. The method was generalized into one where the more advanced students were used to disseminate knowledge to the less advanced students. It was a pass it on system which spread across cultures and developed cooperative learning practices. So, Dr. Andrew Bell, he ran an orphanage just outside Madras in Egmore and he thought, uh, cripes, how, how do I fulfill my remit in my job? And he documented seeing local children. The older ones were teaching the younger ones by drawing in the sand. And he went, that's it. And around this tiny moment, crystallized a whole system of education. He returned to Britain thinking, I've got to tell everybody how successful this is. And the National Society got behind his method. And these two names, Andrew Bell and Joseph Lancaster, represent two giants in this field. Uh, Joseph Lancaster was a Quaker, and the Catholic world absorbed this, this idea and disseminated it as widely as they could. Well, the principle of passing on knowledge is most important here. Uh, Peer-led teaching made many advances possible. The history of the ragged schools and free education is massive, so today I've only touched on a, a few figures in it. Uh, but I would like to encourage everybody to go out and find out more. Manchester is a big, big centre of this. Uh, it's, it's, it's got roots in this history all around us. Uh, Angel Meadow is, is particularly cited. Um, 
So, the Ragged University project is, of course, inspired by the Ragged Schools movement. Collectively, as individuals, everybody involved is trying to reanimate this pragmatic philanthropic tradition using available infrastructure, pubs, cafes, libraries, and common technology, internet, basic computers, screens and projectors, they're all around us. Anywhere that screens sport, there's a potential classroom. Also, we don't need really cutting edge computers to get involved. Uh, we, we can go on a relatively old computer that you might find thrown out you know, that, and not recycled uh, and set it up and you can go online and you can listen to uh, talks from universities around the world, Harvard, Oxford, Yale, the educations that I can personally afford. Uh, we can go into the libraries and we've got privy to vast, vast collections of knowledge. Uh, this, I, I wrote a blog article asking what if Aristotle had a PC. <laughs> it's an interesting thought. Um, what a soft <laughs> yeah. uh, Can you imagine them on Facebook? Or <laughs> 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 sorry? The two of them. Yeah, well, uh, you have to have loads of people. With we could all sit and we could watch them ding dong it out, you know, <laughs> uh, slag each other. But uh, so I, I'm, that's that's what I've written down. There, there are many, many figures that I could dig out. Uh, anybody heard of uh, the Waifs and Straits? It is a, now a, a bit of a. a a phrase in common language. The Waste and Strays Society was a, a ragged school or a ragged organization. It was a, an educational organization. Starting this project was down in Hackney and I walked the A10 and I asked every independent business, what do you think of this idea? I get people who love what they do into your pub or cafe or restaurant and they just share what they love talking about because they make it interesting. Uh, would you give, our, uh, give us your venue for free? Out of 33 venues asked, 31 said yes. About six jumped over the bar <laughs> going, we've got waste and sprays here, we want to be involved. Uh, it's, it's a time where uh, Universities are, and colleges and formal education institutions are looking to bring their learning out into the community. And the community, well, like me, <laughs> I really want to know what's going on inside. I want to be able to talk about ideas. Is this idea right? How do we test this? Peer led teaching is what's happening tonight in conversation. We don't have to be able to trap it under a cup. We don't have to be able to measure it, hence no questionnaires, you know. Um, it, the, there's a lot of people getting involved. And we can look at the, the internet now and think how we can create this infrastructure and do some interesting things, have some more nice lights like this. So with that, I will... Uh, stop and take some questions, uh, if you have any, please. and the Castle Hotel here have been brilliant. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful independent business and they're being really supportive. Uh, thanks to all of them. They do very nice beer. Uh, 
it's quite easy to find vendors. What, what I'm keen to do is find, expand this out. So get people owning the concept. Everybody is a ragged university. You're all unique and distinct bodies of knowledge. So yes, there, there are lots of venues. Uh, it's organizing those venues. And the, the method or strategy at the moment is simply to start in, in one place. So people start to know where it's happening. Oh, that happens once quarterly at the moment. But it would be nice to move that to once monthly. In Edinburgh, we're doing it once monthly. So, yeah. I, I, mean, I was just curious about how you can stimulate interest in young people to actually want to learn. It's not so much about the venue and the peer education. You talked about computers and the, the available knowledge on there, but getting a young person to sit down and listen to that and want to know seems to me to be a huge current issue from yeah. my personal experience. Well, I, I was one of those kids. <laughs> I'm still one of those kids. Um, and the, the, the educational theory that I identify with is we like sharing knowledge. Sit in any public space and listen to what we're doing. We finish work and if we love our work, we go out and we continue to talk about our work with other people. We, we meet somebody and we go, oh, did you see that documentary on such and such channel? It's a, it's a fundamental part of interpersonal relationships. We, uh, if we use a person-centered approach, so think, think about educators, famously Montessori uh, practice, takes this into consideration. Listen to their interests, listen to people, what people love doing. They'll never tire of it. Uh, that's, that's my theory. And uh, I've not found an exception yet. Uh, is that, how, how does that bear out? Uh, I don't know if I'm being too unfair or, or my experience of your people is too narrow. I don't know what, I can't, Watching a documentary, discussing a documentary when you go, doesn't happen for many young people. They might watch Hollyoaks or they might watch EastEnders, or and maybe I'm being a little bit subject and a little bit unkind, but, or maybe it's just a group of young people who disenfranchised from education. And it's that group I'm thinking, how do you reach out to them? Uh, you let them choose. I mean, I, I chose the pub environment, I quite like it, I relax it. It's, it's, a, it's a living room. We all share this. We all own this. We all know the, uh, the rules by which we interact here. We all share this space. Now, where do kids most want to be? And uh, there, there's a very good RSA animal on this. Changing Paradigms in Education. Uh, it's by Sir Ken Robinson. And he's discussing how you know, educators all over the place are having to rethink how education is delivered and conceived. And he comments on how we're coming out of, we're, we're in a post-industrial society, and a lot of the education techniques are based on uh, the division of labor. So, where there, there was that discovery, right? Okay, if we get 16 different people to make pins, we make a lot more pins. It was so successful, we started applying it everywhere. Is it, a question here is, is it, does it have too much of a place in education? For example, are interdisciplinary thought, is interdisciplinary thought to, is, is interdisciplinary thought lacking here? Uh, we, we cannot apply the division of labor to teaching, canning and packing. Uh, and I think a lot of people find themselves uh, struggling with the constraints. I, I hate fluorescent lights. I can't concentrate. Uh, 
but a lot of learning environments have fluorescent lights in them. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a complex question, uh, but maybe we can make these spaces to... Sorry, can you talk? Yeah. I've got a 15 year old boy. Yeah. He absolutely hates the school. It's mm -hmm. the most boring place that he could ever go to in his life. Yeah, when he gets home, he's studying philosophy, sociology, listening to Stephen Fry, he's on the internet looking at nuclear physics, and that's where his interests lie. But he doesn't learn anything at school. So getting back to the point of what this chap says, it's quite right that children should be allowed to follow their own instincts more, in my opinion. I mean, you know. What, what can you do with kids at 15? What can you do with teenagers who don't like going to school? May I? What can you do? Um, I mean, I come from a formal <laughs> educational context, so it's lovely to be able to engage with a very informal context. In relation to your question, Nick, and in relation to, to your question, I just wanted to pick up on something that you were saying, um, Alex, about the Madras system. Yes. And, and weave that into the discussion here because there's a lovely continuum here and it's humbling to be reminded of the way that education has evolved uh, over centuries really but there's a wonderful project in, in, which is taking place in India and has been taking place for quite a while and I went to see the guy that um, um, instituted this project and it's called The Hole in the Wall and it takes place in India. And I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name and I really should be able to remember it. But what he does, he's just like the, um, the children um, writing in the sand. He sets up a computer in the middle of a, what is essentially a slum area. And none of the children know how to work this computer. So they go up to it. And the, first of all, they try and work out what it is because they've not encountered this before. And they spend some time trying to work out what it is, and then one of them gets it. And they say, ooh, come over here, come over here, because I can show you this. And then they all start to get it. And this is wonderful, which is leading back to what um, um, Alex was saying about the peer learning. There's this wonderful animation, and I've actually seen film of this, and it is quite extraordinary. Kids love teaching other kids. And, and this is beautifully exemplified by this project. And if any of you can, uh, I can absolutely send this out because it is wonderful to see the, the level of inspiration there. And I actually work in the School of Education uh, and think about these things. Uh, and there are a lot of figures, uh, uh, particularly uh, a guy called Lier Vygotsky, who's a Russian, who looks at this, which is kind of, and I was just wondering whether Joseph Lancaster and Andrew Bell um, whether those are fed into Vygotsky's thinking. But we think about how we might get um, kids to work together in exactly the way that you're talking about, how they might use the internet and ask questions of the internet and move from what essentially is a very formalized context into something which is less formalized. And this is a major challenge because it almost challenges the system as is now. And it's interesting to hear that you know people are bored in the educational system and it's this perennial challenge and yet we have the, the technologies now and we've always had the technologies look at people writing in the sand to begin to engage with this challenge and find solutions and from my own experience watching my nieces engaging with this what they're very able to do is ask questions in a way that I wasn't able to at school because if ever I asked, I formulated a question. The likelihood was that the teacher said, sorry, there's no time. I'd love to, but there's no time. Now they can ask questions, they can go to the internet and they can engage in the internet and engage with other people around them. So this is going to be a challenge for us. How you actually, and it, it moves very far away from the discourse that, we're, that we have now, for example, um, the governmental discourse and there's nothing wrong with that but we've got these immense opportunities now and I think thinking about people like Andrew Bell and these informal contexts that ought to be informing what we're doing now and isn't necessarily so I think in relation to these are real challenges and what we have to do is engage uh, um, um, young people 
in these challenges. But in, in response to what you were saying, I think young kids are already doing this. I think they're just going off and learning. And they come into the informal environments like this and they're going, they're going to be set to go. So I'm actually very, very optimistic about what's going to happen in educational terms. Well, I actually read a quote on Alex's website, which is teach less and learn more. I'm sure that that's, that's right. That's, so what that's what we're trying to do. That's, that's what, what teachers are trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there is a discrepancy yeah. between what we're asked to do and what we want to do. And that's the tension and that's the challenge. Uh, Alex, can I pick up on this concept now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm bus pass man. As, as of now, I'm bus pass now. What that means is that my concept of now lasts for sort of 50 years. And I realise that 50 years is actually pretty trivial with regards to most of the questions we're going to face. But the amount of change in education, in, in, in uh, the NHS, in which, you know, I'm as old as the NHS. Uh, so, you know, I came in, I, I was one of the initiators on whom National Drive Milk was experimented. And I think it's worked bloody well, but then I never knew what it would be like before. Uh, but what you've got in education is a phenomenal rate of change. I can remember my grandfather saying that the reason that he stuttered was that every time he tried to write with his left hand, somebody whacked it. You know? That sort of stuff was going on, and it was for your own good, and all the rest of it. But, but the reality is that what we've moved to now is an education system which stops stuffing people with facts and tries to initiate the sort of thing we're all talking about, which is kids thinking for themselves. And that's taking place on a grand scale within the public sector all the time. And it's part of the tradition you're talking about. But we underestimate the effectiveness and the, and the, the widespreadness of that process. And it's a very healthy and dynamic process. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up for being crap all the time. I have a message. Let's have fun. <laughs> Look up fun theory. There's some interesting psychological work done here. Now, <coughs> the, a, a team of marketers set out to work out how can we get people in the London Underground to choose to use the steps rather than the escalators. And if you know, that's, that's quite a task. Well, they turned the stairs into a piano. And they just sat a camera there and watched it. And the, the change in traffic is amazing. And then you see people dancing on the stairs, all of these things. A, a bin where you, you put something in and all you hear is And then people are going around collecting rubbish, <laughs> feeding it. It's fun for you. If it's fun, people don't run out of energy. And admit a dynamic approach, sit and have a game. And that one point, you know, play Rome Total War. Oh, this is when Mount Vesuvius erupts. Uh, these, you know, we. We've got to be dynamic. We can't. There's, there's a, there's a place for rote, but there's a limited place for rote. Everything is placed in its final Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Do, if you wanted to stick around to listen to Sue, who's going to be on in, in 10 minutes.